And today on the Brass Junkies, well, <laughs> that's not the right intro. <laughs> All right, here we go. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Brass Junkies. I'm your host, Andrew Hitz, and I am joined by Pittsburgh's finest euphonium player in his 50s, Lance LeDuc. Lance, is that true? And how are you? Uh, I'm well. I <laughs> think it's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like where you started until I threw that qualification. You were like, nah, 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 no, and then I'm like, in your how 50s. Old is, how old is she? How old is he? From Niles, yes, Michigan. 50s. Yes. yes. <laughs> the she- best euphonium player in their 50s from Niles, Michigan, currently living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Lance LeDuc. City of Four Flags. How awesome was this conversation that we had with Kevin Newton of Amani Wins? I, he's just such a cool, he's just cool. First of all, but yes, fascinating to talk to really interesting, genuine, down to earth, awesome refreshing, human, awesome. Yeah. Just I like, left the conversation energized. Yeah. Which like, I, and I always enjoy Brass Junkies interviews. That's why we're still doing them after 180 of them. I think we could probably hang it up and people wouldn't be like, wait, you don't, <laughs> are you, no, no. that's not too many. Yeah. Well, yeah, no one would really say that. <laughs> But I, I mean, I always enjoy them, but like, you know, they don't always leave me refreshed because I'm staring. I got bright lights shining in my face and I'm staring at a computer screen. I just, I left like smiling and like feeling more content about everything uh, after what you all are about to just hear. Just what a, what a gift. Yeah, Super he's... inspirational. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And he did call me sir before the interview. That I was bummed just going to say, bit. and before yeah, we but... started, he called Lance sir, which yeah. was which was wonderful. I, I mean, I, I mean, he, it could have been terrible and I would have called the interview refreshing after it started off that way. So, uh, which reminds me that I need to thank Parker Malpieces for providing the hosting for the Brass Junkies. Parker thank Malpieces you, offers fine customizable component mouthpieces for horn, <laughs> trombone, euphonium, and tuba, including the Andrew Hitz artist model tuba mouthpiece and the Lance LeDuc model euphonium mouthpiece. You can find out more at parkermouthpieces.com or follow them on Facebook Instagram and Twitter. Twitter. Uh, I think everyone should go to uh, ParkerMouthpieces.com, <laughs> click on the contact form, and then send a uh, send an email to Michael, and just say, uh, "Dear Sir," uh, something to the effect of, uh, "It's so great that the uh, that that the previous generation like yourself has uh, shown people like me what's possible." I just wanted to say thank you, sir. Like just. You know, just like underhandedly make him feel old. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, at least I would say the goal should be three times. If you can hit mm-hmm. four or five in a quick paragraph, then do it. And if enough of you email, then I will get a text from him saying, what the hell did you say? <laughs> Which is always the goal when we send you to send him silly email. But his Maybe do it in all awesome. caps like old people do. <laughs> <laughs> Which I haven't done. You know, here's my old man text thing. I punctuate. I... <clears throat> The first, without without fail, I punctuate. The, the first time that I learned that like that 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 there is a, a generation of people who all apparently agree that like adding punctuation to a text message is like is a form of aggression. Oh, <laughs> I was like, fine. I was like, wait, wait a minute. I'm okay with wait, that too. Did you get this? Is just like this. Just suddenly you all woke up and this was just understood that like you know. I'm not talking about like dear Lance, comma enter enter like you know, mm-hmm. like, but. But just you know, like what time will the lesson be? Question mark. You know, that's like that's like oh oh they're oh they oh they got a little edgy, huh? Oh, mm-hmm. you woke up on the wrong side of the bed, yeah? Putting that question mark there on that text. No, yeah, that's yeah. I'm I'm leaning in on that one. I and I love the people who uh you know who who abbreviate like Renan Meyer, one of my dearest friends of time for three. He'll like instead of texting okay, he'll write K every once in a while. I'll be like. What did you do with all the time that you saved by not like you know typing the O and then he'll just you know tell me to shut up. So um, you anyway, do, like, you text back like W and he'll be like, <laughs> "Well, I, assu- I I I assumed that you would know that that meant well that will be fine." So I just See, put the I, W. I to tie this to to bring us back. I think the reason that we both found Kevin so refreshing yeah. and uplifting is because we are not like us. <laughs> 
<laughs> thank you to our Patreon Fair. patrons. Uh, thank you to everybody who's left a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And the YouTube channel is kind of kicking butt. So uh, Will really Houchin does a lot amazing. of... Yeah, yeah. It's, it's doing well. So uh, you can go and subscribe on YouTube and you can find all the links at pedalotemedia.com as always. And without further ado, let's get to the conversation between two not helpful or uplifting people with someone who is so helpful and uplifting that it actually will leave you feeling good, even though he was outnumbered. Amani Wins's Kevin Newton. Hey, thanks for watching. If you want to see more content by the Brass Junkies, just click on the like and subscribe button. You'll have an opportunity to see some of the greatest brass players in the world and Andrew and me. And today on the Brass Junkies, we are joined by a, a, a rising superstar in the uh, in the horn world. It feels like every time that I log on to the internet, that uh, that this young man has like has got some new major like teaching or playing gig. And so I, uh, but he's he's accomplished a ton, and he's only just getting started. His name is Kevin Newton. Kevin, how are you? I am fantastic. Very happy to be here. Yeah, we're we're very very glad that you could uh, that you could join us today. So the we're gonna get to like the the really big news is that you're relatively recently now a member of Amani Wins. It's funny because of the pandemic, it's like things that happened like two years ago feel like it was like a few months ago to me. So I realize it's actually been a little longer than I think. But uh, but you're the latest member of Amani Wins. That's which is uh, I, I can't imagine how exciting that must be. We're gonna come. We're gonna circle back to that. Um, okay. Can you tell us about uh, growing up in uh, in South Boston, Virginia? Maybe tell us where that is first for people who don't know, and then that leads to the fact uh, that your first teacher was someone who uh, who you knew pretty well. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think it's a I'm I'm pretty unique. I think uh, in most of the circles that I run in um, here, at least in New York City. Uh, because I am from such a small town. Uh, South Boston, the joke about where I grew up is that there's a Walmart and a high school. Uh, and <laughs> Which one? Where did you spend more time? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> the, uh, neither, actually. But the, the joke, <laughs> Stay in school, kids. The, uh, the real joke is that uh, it's not a joke. Uh, <laughs> so anyway... South Boston, <laughs> South Boston is this uh, little little town. Uh, basically, when you look at the map of Virginia, um, if you look at the southernmost central part of it, where you see like a lot of green and not a lot else, that's that's where South Boston is. It's about an hour north of um, the North Carolina border and smack dab in the center of the state. Uh, yeah, but um, growing up there was great. Uh, actually, I, I loved every second of it. I love that place um, because it instilled in me, uh, you know, the values that I carry with me today, which is which which are that, you know, this beauty and pretty much everything, especially people. And uh, anyway, that's that is the basis of uh, how I make music. You know, that's that's really what I believe in. Um, but yeah, my, my first music teacher was my mother. We actually had uh, about at one point an hour and at another point a 40 minute drive from our home uh, to work and school. Uh, I actually went to school for a long time in a place called Danville, which is, which is a little ways away, 45 minutes away. Um, and during that car ride, it was basically just a lot of listening to either NPR, uh, which is maybe like 10% of the time, the other 90% of the time, uh, my mom would put things on and say, sing the alto line. And I would start singing, and then she'd say, no, it's this. And then she'd sing it. Uh, and so it was- Get out of the car. For years, for years <laughs> I mean, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> was, You're flat. It was that for years. It was a lot of ear training. Uh, and um, and I don't know if she thought of it that way, but but that's, that's what it ended up being for me, for sure. Uh, so I'm very, very blessed in that regard. But uh, yeah, no, she was a, a church pianist and she's a wonderful singer. Um, so I was, you know, so that also influences the way that I think about the horn as well, that my formative musical experience was was singing and then also, you know, te her teaching me piano. How were you drawn to the horn? 
Um, so I was always encouraged to listen. So the, you know, in my house, music was always playing. Um, we're always, always singing, always making music in some kind of way. Um, and so in everything I was, I was encouraged to listen and pay attention to what I was listening to. Um, so actually for me is, is the same as many, many horn players, which is, uh, movies, um, movies were a super important thing to me growing up. Uh, I went with my family, you know, once a week, usually I went with my friends once a week. So you, you know, you would find me at the movies twice a week, eight times a month, uh, and really listening. Um, and so I didn't know what the horn was actually. Uh, but I just knew that it was the, the most beautiful sound. Uh, it, it felt like the voice that I heard, you know, inside my head. And so that's why, oh, man, if I could, if I could, uh, you know, get some of that sound going, uh, I would be doing something special. And so when it came time to pick instruments, I was one of those kids, those rare, odd kids that picked the horn as their first instrument. <laughs> they said, are you sure? Are you we got saxophones if you want them. <laughs> I'm married to a horn player, so I'm trying not to react to one of those weird kids who chose the horn line. I'm just going to let you just keep right on talking, Kevin. <laughs> you know, this is uh, a slight aside, but I've noticed um, that the last couple of movies I've gone to, they've started um, putting the orchestra, the orchestras listed, the personnel is listed. Yeah. Is that a, was there a union change? What happened? I think that there had I think that there has been a union change. I I I saw yeah, Encanto is uh, is one of them that has all of them listed, and then I saw some other people mentioning it's it's kind of Spider cool, right? Spider Man, yeah, like seeing well, yeah. like eight violists listed. It's like, well, yeah, like why? It's not like there's like a real estate issue at the end of a movie. I mean, the credits <laughs> go on for like eight minutes. It can be eight minutes and eleven seconds, you know? Right. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Right. Oh, that's that's pretty amazing. amazing. It's kind of neat that you didn't even realize that you were listening to a horn. You just heard that. How many horn players have an origin story of like of movies? J.D. Shaw, our former colleague in Boston Brass, yeah, he heard uh, he went he saw Out of Africa. Um, he's mm -hmm. he's slightly older than you are. Um, and uh, in the theater, <laughs> and like and he heard like the intro, and I'm not sure if he knew it was a horn, but he just heard. You know, I think he uses the word majestic, and you know, and then he was like, I want to play that, and. Um, yeah. My wife was drawn to horn in uh, Star Wars movies growing up, and yeah, it's like, yeah, horn is prominently featured in movies. It's, uh, yeah, it's awesome. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we it's it's really a beautiful thing. You know, we had some people, Vince DeRosa, namely, you know, build uh, that world for horn players, basically um, from scratch, uh, and the result is, you know, we get to play. The, mo the best solos, basically, uh, for a very long time in film, uh, you know, and that tradition continues in a, in a very big way. And, you know, I, th I think about it like this, like, you know, if you were young, uh, a young kid at a different time in a different, uh, on a different continent, you might go to, um, you know, you might go see the opera or and you hear something there that inspires you, something that you haven't heard before. Or if you're here, you know, you might go, um, probably not a club as a kid, but you know, just, you know, you might, for, I mean, you go to church or something, you know what I mean? And you hear people do something that's very important, which was my experience. Uh, so film is like that, I think, for a lot of horn players that, you know, we're very lucky that we have a, a medium that features us so prominently that uh, we got to, you know, we got to hear what, what horn players really can do and have the instrument pushed well so you you're i mean this in a very loving way but you're a weird kid if you show up and you already <laughs> have had a bunch of ear training and you're drawn to this instrument that um, <laughs> is not only unique but is unique watch this is not only unique but is uniquely um uh, equipped to allow you to deploy the ear training because it's so hard for beginner horns to to wrestle that beast just because the parcels are so close so you had to have been uh, just like this gift that that landed in the your your music educator's lap so how was it a large band program or like what what was the the, the relationship with you and your, your music educators like in, in school so i have to i i am so happy that you asked that question because i think that that is something that is one of the most important things uh, in my life that I have had 
the best possible mentors from the beginning. Hmm. Um, Name them. You know. Go ahead. Tell, tell us know, who well, they I, are. I will. Yeah, good. I will. Good, good, good. Um, you know, uh, starting at home, you know, so it starts like, you know, I had like my family, of course, they're all like um, very, uh, very education forward. Uh, they really, really believe in education, and there's a whole history behind that, but I won't get into that. That's a very long story. But, uh, you know, I grew up with a lot of educators, um, and so I was always expected to be excellent at whatever I did. So I kind of went into things with that kind of mind frame and then had these people. So, I mean, starting even in middle school, you know, uh, um, David Gore was my first band teacher. Uh, he was the one that thought I was weird for picking the horn. He was a trumpet player. Uh, <laughs> Look who's talking there, you know, Mr. So Gore. They're always projecting those <laughs> trumpet players. <laughs> uh, you know, and I... <laughs> notice notice him disagreeing. He's a... Yeah, he's just he's just laughing and moving on. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, <"Whew>, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, and he he pushed me a whole lot, and then. You know, so I was playing in the high school marching band. I was one of four kids playing in a high school marching band as a middle schooler. Um, and then I got to high school and uh, Reginald Purvis uh, was my, my band director. And he is one of the most important people I've ever met uh, in my life. Because first and foremost, uh, it was the first time that I had seen a black man working in music you know, in some capacity, the very, the very first time other than wow. church. Um, and he was uh, a hard ass, uh, to say, to say the least. Um, he really, he really worked us crazy hard. Uh, he had the highest expectations for us, but he was, you know, at the same time, the kind of person that would uh, do anything for you. You know, if you, if you needed anything, he would, he was there for you. And, and push, push, would push you towards the things that you needed to do. So, I mean, I was the first kid in, I think, eight years to make Allstate from that band program. And it was because, you know, he really, uh, he really cultivated my love of, of music and of the horn and pushed me, you know, nothing was, was ever quite good enough. There's always, there's always bigger and better. Um, and that's, that's so important because that is, that's how I think all the time, even now, you know, even especially now, actually, uh, as a professional, um, and as, as an educator. Um, but you know, at the same time, you know, I was, I was in the orchestra there. So, so I should stop here for a second and say that, um, you know, not a crazy amount of professional music happening <laughs> in South Boston and Danville. Um, so, uh, one of the most important things that happened was that a i was really invigorated by playing the horn i wanted to play the horn uh in whatever way i could so i was playing in wind ensemble i was playing mellow in the marching band band i was playing the horn in our orchestra we had a full orchestra at my high school i was very lucky um in that regard one of the only ones in the area uh and um i was playing in our community orchestra uh, the Danville Symphony Orchestra, and that was a great experience because I got to, you know, the older guys didn't want to play first, so I got to play first on everything for three years. Uh, <laughs> Make the kid do it. That's right. <laughs> you oh, know, you know what you should it do. Was, it was awesome. That's great. It was awesome. That's great. Um, but anyway, you know, so that's so all through my formative years, I had these these people that were pushing me. And uh, one one thing about uh, Mr. Purvis that's really, really important is that he always made it a point to expose us to groups and to musicians that were far better than us. He would sign us up for competitions that we had no business uh, going to. You know, we were uh, in the Northeast um, competing against, uh, you know, these, these bands that these huge, huge bands. I mean, we had we had a large band. It was over a hundred hundred piece band, but um, you know, and having to sit and listen to them, you know, <laughs> and he insisted, you know, you sit and you listen, and um, that was so important uh, because it let me know, oh, there's something else. There's there's always something else. There's something higher, something better to work towards. So you know, and then I got to college and uh, VCU, 
was an amazing experience. The professors there are fantastic. Uh, Andrew, you know, you you just informed me that you were teaching there. I had I had no idea. That's awesome. Yeah, um, it was brief, but I really enjoyed it. And uh, um, Terry was the officiant of our wedding. Oh wow! How about that, yeah, yeah, isn't wow. that wild? Yeah, he and he and my wife are, uh, you know, very very close because she went to VCU as a horn player. Um, yeah, back. Oh uh, wow! I didn't know that. Yep, yeah, back in the day. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Tiny, tiny world. Yes, sir. So I just something else just popped into my head. I got an email. <clears throat> I guess it was a Facebook message because you care about that. Like that was important that I told you <laughs> that. That was. I don't know why. But there you have it. I can't. You anyway. saved us both a follow-up question with oh, that, Lance. Thank good you. Gravy. Anyway, it's a former guest of our show wrote to tell me that because we it was I don't remember which episode a recent episode we we told the listeners or asked the listeners you know if you, if there's a music educator that that made a difference in your life reach out to them and thank them tell them what a difference they made in your life like today. And somebody did it. Somebody followed up, and it was a former guest, and they they hadn't heard the episode, but they, the in the thank you, they said they got the, there was a student that they uh, taught twenty years ago, hmm. and uh, so it was just it was real powerful. So hmm. thank them, thank them. I mean us, we should, but anyone who's listening, you know, get on the horse, send an email, send a quick text, just to, just let them know uh, how much it, it made a difference in your life. Cool. That's yeah, awesome. abso- absolutely. I, uh, I I always I keep in touch with all of my teachers for that exact reason. You know, it's it's important that um, you know people get their flowers and that mm-hmm. they know that you that you appreciate what you gave to them um, or what they gave to you. Excuse me. Uh, and well, uh, <laughs> and and you didn't mean to misspeak, but it's also true that way it too. Is true. I mean, it just it reminds. I mean, because when you get to teach a student like when just a kevin newton comes through your band program or through your college studio or through your community orchestra or whatever it's like yeah you gar- i wasn't there but i guarantee you made some serious impact um and uh yeah it goes two ways because it also rejuvenates teachers yeah. right i mean yeah for for sure so yeah. yeah you probably shouldn't reach out to your teachers to remind them <laughs> how much you did for them like- <laughs> Here's my bill. Hey, How's you know, that recruiting going? Yeah, you know how you drop my name like in every single perspective, uh, yeah, audition. Like you're welcome. Yeah, I, I was just thinking about that. Yep. Hope you're well. XOXO. <laughs> so let's um wait, wait. since we're stopped, let's pause your journey right here. Um, Ladies and hey, gentlemen, can I tell you about the Mary Pappard School of Music at Duquesne University in beautiful and sunny Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where it's kind of sort of both today. It's sunny ish. <laughs> And despite the snow, well, because of the snow, I guess it is also sort of beautiful today. So anyway, at the Mary Pappas School of Music at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, there's a wonderful um, series of professors and programs and ensembles that you can play with if you're a brass player. And so we want to encourage you to click on the link in the show notes to go find out all the ways you can participate in music and the brass area at Duquesne University. We want to encourage you to do that right now. At first, you hit pause. You thank your music educators. Then you go visit the Duquesne University website and the Mary Pappert School of Music. And then if you're uh, uh, of a mind to, dash off a note to our dear friend who's made this possible, Jim. Let's see. What would be a good one for this? Because I want you to specifically put it in the, maybe in the message line. Dear Professor Jim Aloysius you're like, going to have to look it up. And actually, don't look it up. Just your best guess at how to spell Aloysius. Jim Aloysius Nova, thank you so much for being a sponsor of the Brass Junkies. And I want you to know that I hope you're having a good day. Love, and enter, Kevin Newton. And enter discount code Kevin Newton for up to ten grand off a year in tuition. So, yeah, yeah. Some restrictions apply. Yeah. <laughs> as, in, <laughs> as in we're restricted from doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I'm safe for saying that since there is not exactly a place when you go to pay for college, there's not a field that says enter discount code here. Yeah, that's yeah true, it's yeah. like yeah, there there ain't no discount code field. So uh, I want to leave lots of time. Not. I want to leave lots of time for what you're doing uh, now. But your your journey is really fascinating, and I think that you uh, have a real gift for like 
putting it into words. Like it, it sounds to me like you're filled with appreciation, which is kind of coming through in what you're saying and how you're saying it. So VCU Richmond is obviously a much bigger, uh, you know, pond than, um, you know, than South Boston, but then like right. going to New York city for, uh, you know, for graduate school is like, I mean, that's as big as ponds get. Like what was, what was it like? Like when you got dropped off in New York city? Um, I mean, that's just such a, I mean, on a human level or on a musician level, what was that like? Um, well, to answer that question, I have to start just slightly before that. Great. And say that a big part of my trajectory was that I had no lessons uh, before I got to, I had two lessons actually before I got to college. Um, and that's super important, I think, wow. to say. Great. That was uh, me great. Too. Uh, people, people, awesome. Like, pe- people need to hear that, I think, because that's, that's going to be a big, a big through line to what it was like moving to New York, um, wow. be- because uh, I entered into undergrad in a different mind state. Right. Uh, because of that, I just thought, oh, I really love this and I want to do this, and so that's what fueled it. And so I had the initiative to reach out to people and kind of go for things, uh, and that that made a huge difference. So. By the time I got ready to, um, when I when I graduated from undergrad, uh, I took two years off, and I went and took lessons with people to figure out what I wanted. I bartended, I played in an orchestra called the Waynesboro Symphony, um, and just kind of tried to spend that time figuring out where I really wanted to be. And I was studying with a teacher at the time, a fat Arnie Cochran that was from New York. She um, pushed me towards uh new york um and so i had a lot of information i I think from her because you know she did both of her degrees at juilliard um and she had done a lot of a lot of work in new york before she moved to virginia um so anyway so the really short answer is that before i moved to new york i was terrified you know, I had information, I had some context, um, but I needed to reach out to people uh, and figure out, like, hey, like, how do I how do I do this? So I reached out to like David Birdmarrow, for example, um, uh, and asked him, and he was very kind. He talked to me on the phone for like an hour and <laughs> gave me a lot of information about what freelancing was like and um, that kind oh, of thing. Helpful. You know, and then, you know, I reached out to uh, Marshall Seely and, you know, same. He was very kind and very forthcoming with, with information and that kind of stuff. And actually gave me my first gigs when I got to the city. Um, so because I was coming from this kind of do it yourself kind of um, mind frame, once I got to New York, it kind of felt like, OK, let's go. You know, like, let's let's get this done. I got two years to figure this thing out. Um, before I got to like start making some money and you know so honestly like coming to New York I think I had my head down in a way I was really really tunnel vision on like okay career I gotta make a career work um and you know uh it worked out but actually I love I love New York (laughs) I have to say this and uh, I'm saying this as an introvert I, I love that uh you know, people are not worried about you. You can just kind of be yourself and do what you need to do. And yeah, nobody cares. <laughs> it's just, it's wonderful. Wow. Wow. What, there's so much of what you just said is so powerful. Like, it's just, I mean, the, I have tried to convince when I've been asked in like a mentoring role, I've tried to convince so many students to take at least a year between undergrad and grad to do exactly what you did and even how you put it, which was take lessons with a bunch of people and get data, right? It sounds like you get data about what kind of teachers you like, get data about, about yourself as a human and what direction you exactly want to go in, like just data in general. And then both Lance and I nodded at the same moment when you said that when you got to New York, you said, okay, let's do this. I've got two years to figure this out and to turn this into a career. Um, and yeah, that's, um, it is much more common for people to start school and then, you know, like halfway through senior year or like, you know, a little, usually a little earlier in the second year of graduate school, but in that last year when they go, 
oh crap, like what is, you know, <laughs> there's no runway after May 10th, you know? And you right. got like at the first step of the runway, you were like, I see the end of the runway. I need to make more runway before I get there. And that's, um, that's wise beyond your years. That's, uh, that's awesome. Really good stuff. Thanks. Yeah, there you go. What was well, that? Did that feel like a scary decision at the time? Because I think there's a lot of students who go to pursue a master's because that's what you're supposed to do next. And I don't know what else mm -hmm. I'm supposed to do. And I don't feel like being a bartender. So I don't know what I'm going to go do. <laughs> so <clears throat> did that. But it, I mean, the maturity level, the difference between those two years is, is, is night and day. Uh, no offense if you're closer to my kid's age than mine, but that's that's where I live. So was it was that a, like a scare? You just knew this is what I need to do. Or how did you make that decision? Or did anybody help you make that decision? Um, well, yes, no, it was it was definitely scary, um, which is a big part of why I needed to. OK, so let me back up a second. When I was an undergrad, I almost quit music and it wasn't for being surrounded. It wasn't because I wasn't surrounded by amazing musicians and by amazing uh, educators and experiences and that kind of thing. It was because of Rex, really wasn't because... it? Hey, man. <laughs> you just come here and need to talk to you about a thing, Kat. Uh... Speaking, speaking, <laughs> of, speaking of him, I, uh, he's one of those mentors, again, that like really pushed me in the right direction. Uh, awesome. And I missed them. I was just at the Mid Midwest Band Clinic, and I, I missed him by two days. I was very upset about that. Um, but... Uh, yeah, no, I just, I wasn't really seeing myself uh, in horn playing. And I think that that's just the product of how the education, the music education system is set up and that it is limiting that if you go into school and you are a horn player, you're told, okay, like you can be in an orchestra. You can like, I guess, go to Texas and be in a band or Japan. Like, you know, it's, you don't if you don't have, uh, if you don't have people uh, teaching you that have gone through other paths yeah. you don't really see them um and i was like i don't really want to be an orchestral musician um mm. i felt like those are chops that i needed to develop which is why i went for the orchestra performance degree for my master's but um you know i that wasn't really where my heart was and i, I almost quit and it actually was because of uh a performance um that I heard that was one of the military bands in a nonet, uh, and they performed a nonet arrangement of Valerie Coleman's Emoja. Now, at this particular point in my musical experience, I had no idea who Valerie Coleman was. I had no idea who the Amani Winds were. Um, I just knew that I was kind of drowning in the horn a little mm. bit, uh, and the fire was the fire was dying. Mm. Um, but I heard that and I thought, oh, my God, like, that's that's me. That sounds like me. Uh, you know, it it invigorated me in the same way that like like church music did as I, when I was growing up or like going to the movies or what have you. Um, and I thought, oh, man, like if I can like I can do that. And then it was yeah, I was reinvigorated. I immediately went and looked up for Monty Williams and formed the Woodwind Quintet. And we like started learning all the rep and like we, we performed a lot of music on all of our recitals and that kind of thing. And so I think that having been exposed in that way changed the way that I thought about how I approached music, because then it became evident to me that, oh, like you can create things. You know, it's not like you have to be an orchestra musician or you have to be like some soloist, you know. Um, which of course, you know, thank God for those people. Cause you know, that's, we need that music, but it's just like, oh, I don't, I don't just have to do those things. So then it became this game of like, okay, how, how do I do it? So the only way to know is to talk to the people, you know, that are doing it. So it was scary, um, moving forward, but I think, uh, kind of what you all were hitting on the fact that I knew kind of what my end game was put me in the right place uh, that I didn't have to, um, I mean, it was the path of least resistance. That's what I'll say. So even though it was scary, once I got there, it was kind of, it was like swimming, um, you know, in the pool of 
in the the river of the of the energy I wanted. And uh, that's so before I went to school, I decided I wanted to study with David Jolly. That's what I'm trying to get to. Um, he had done a lot of the things that, first of all, I mean, he's one of my heroes. And he had done a lot of the things that I wanted to do. He had taught Jeff Scott. So I thought probably there was some, <laughs> there was some kind of, you know, there's something happening there, you know. Uh, <laughs> so I went and I applied to every school that he taught at and ended up going to uh, MSM. Um, which actually was, was my top choice uh, in studying with him, did the orchestral performance program there, and then studied chamber music and solo with him. So, I mean, it was the best possible scenario. So then once I got there, it was, it was less scary. What would you or say? Here, rather, I should say. You know, when you want to go in a, a I hate to say non-traditional, because uh, who the frick knows, and in, in a non-orchestral direction, let's say, so what were the lessons, like, what did you learn or work on with him that had to do more with chamber music or solo playing rather than just learning the rep for the orchestral auditions? Um, so we, that's what we did in most of our lessons. So I, I am, I count myself extremely lucky to, uh, you know, to have him as, as a mentor he and Marshall Seeley, I would say, definitely are the two biggest mentors I've had in New York. Um, and they have led me in all the exact right directions. Uh, basically, in those lessons um, with Professor Jolly, uh, we would just, we would talk about what I wanted to do professionally. And I would name off all these crazy things. And he would say, okay, I know this person and this person when you do these gigs, this is when you, if you're going to be the type of person that gets hired for these types of gigs that you want, you need to be well versed in a particular set of repertoire. So he said, okay, let's step, let's start you on a path to learn this, you know, let's get you playing Brandenburg. Like let's get you playing the Mozart quintet, like, you know, learning these, these kind of staple pieces uh, for horn players so that, uh, you know, I would have the, the opportunity you know when when the i mean when the opportunity arose that i would be prepared um for for those things um and also solo playing uh and then a lot of it was just career building honestly like he uh we spent a lot of time in my lessons um talking about how to be strategic about what i wanted to get accomplished um and uh you know so two years of that was just like you know, could you codify invaluable. what that what that strategic planning looked like? Um. Well, I don't want to give away his secrets. I'll <laughs> I'll, I'll address it. I, I'll address it how how I approach it with yeah. with my students. Perfect. Um, which is that very very simply. What do you love? Okay, great. Like, if you don't love this. Go do something else. Go do what you love. That's the first thing. If doing this is what you love, what about it do you love? And uh, once you figure that out, then it's just a matter of we are very lucky. Uh, you know, the young people right now is super fortunate that we live in a time where um, we have many of uh, the vast, not the vast majority, but I mean, the majority of the masters that we look up to are still living and that we have uh, the technological means. We have the means to get in contact with them and to talk with them if they're willing to talk with us. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the biggest, well, the biggest step is knowing what you want to do, but then once you know what you want to do and you can focus, talk to the people, you know, ask them the questions, tell them that you're interested in doing something. And if you send, 10 emails, you might get two responses, but those two responses are going to be what matters. Those eight responses don't, the eight, the eight emails that you sent that didn't get a response do not matter. They don't matter. It's the two that, that you got. Um, and yes. so it was mostly just him encouraging me to do that, which is, you know, which was great because that's what I, that's how I already thought anyway. Um, but uh, that's that's kind of what that would look like. And then once I would get bits of information, you know, then it's like, OK, well, let's make a let's make a, a calendar. Let's make a time frame of like you have to have this prepared by this point. You know, you have to do this. You need to if you're talking to this person, you need to talk to this person also like, 
you know, that, that kind of thing, learning the interpersonal part of the business um, and putting it into practice, not just talking about it, not just hoping that I'm going to graduate and win uh, some job, like being very active about, uh, about the things that, that I want, I think is mostly how they were structured. It's uh, <clears throat> students coming into master's programs, especially if you've taken some time, it's a very different, um, it's a very different time of life. You launch out of high school and you're, you're still sort of sorting out who you are and you're kind of trying to figure out what your relationship with your family is. And it's like very scary. And four years is a huge amount of runway and it's all just fuzzy and you're like making new friends and you know, it's like, all, it's very, very different. So then when you're going into your masters, it's eye opening as I, when I'm sitting down with a new grad student, it's finite. We have four semesters. We have we have four semesters in a summer, maybe two summers if you're going to stay in town. But if you're the the quick more quickly, so you showed up with an advantage, which is clarity. And so now yep. it's simple. By the end of the first semester, this. By the end of the second semester, this. Over the summer, that. Then the third semester, that. And then ready to launch on the fourth semester. And it's just like that's it. It goes by so fast. It's 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 like that. There's only five. There's only five units there. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. And then you're done. Wow. So, so I wanted to comment on something that you that you said early, and then I'm, I'm hearing again is the the importance of uh, of representation. You talked about uh, you talked the first time you talked about it was your band director, right? Uh, you know, yes. Mr. Purvis, and that that was the first time that you had ever seen a a black man in the role of a you know music you know musician. I think you said outside of church, right? And yeah. um, and then uh, and then a, a different uh, form of representation was that when you heard that Valerie Coleman composition, and then you heard Horn doing things that were completely different than what you had heard in the movies or in community orchestra, and then like David Jolly, who's like like living the thing and doing all you know, he's firing in all sorts of different directions, and there's like a theme to his career, but he's got so many different outputs. Um, and Marshall yep. Seeley. And so it's, you know, I, I, it's so important that, um, that people uh, seek out whenever possible representation, uh, whether it's how you look or what you want to do, or, uh, you know, I mean, just on, on every possible level. And it's really cool. I, I think that there are maybe other kids who come from where you are who maybe never quite experience that whether it's in you know when it's a smaller pond right that don't quite experience whether music or outside of music right and and mm -hmm. part of that's luck but also part of it is it's very clear that you have worked your butt off uh, from the beginning which i'm sure is a large part to do with your upbringing to be sounds like be curious and the whole education based thing which you said you could have talked about a long time but that's what a great example for everybody where you've just you keep turning stones over and then you keep on occasionally finding like, oh, wait, this is possible. Oh, wait, this person has this in common and they're doing this and that opens up an opportunity and then you run with it. And that's just an that's an awesome uh, an awesome lesson. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You're very kind. So let's awkwardly segue from that heartfelt moment. Before we do, Andrew, I forgot to tell you that Houghton Harms aims to spread the joy of music through providing the highest level of product services and resources to the brass playing community. They have free domestic shipping on all in, uh, I, new items, excluding sheet music, and free domestic returns on new instruments and mouthpieces when you order online at HoughtonHorns.com. They stock the finest makes of brass instruments, including Bach, Con Selmer, Eastman, Shires, Engelbert, Schmidt, Paxman, Tyne, and Yamaha, among many others. Repairs and customizations are done in-house. You can browse the extensive news and resources page on Houghton Horns for great pedagogical info, articles, interviews, videos, and events, and you're not going to believe it. But wait, give you, me a second. You ready? Okay. All right. Go ahead. If you enter the promo code junkies at online checkout, you'll receive 10% off your purchase from houghtonhorns.com. Some limitations apply. <laughs> so, so my, my son is seven and a half. He's very adamant about the half, mm. uh, but he, uh, a couple of times he, 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 um, he misused, um, air, quotes like in you know and then and and it was really funny 
but he now completely understands how to use air quotes, but he has figured out how funny it is when he now intentionally, with no warning, <laughs> and he doesn't even overuse it, just randomly misuses air quotes. You know, it's like, you know, like, like, hey, daddy, like, you know, how long until we eat dinner? It's like, what are you? It's it's real. And he cracks himself up because he knows. Uh, yeah, he's um, he's a handful, man. He was easy at seven, but seven and a half. Yeah, he's he's totally now different. it's yeah, it's totally, totally different. Just uh, just ask. I'm 54 and a third. <laughs> that's just let's call it 53 and four thirds that sound makes you makes you sound younger true uh all right amani wins uh what um what is it like to get to and i didn't even know like your origin story with them in terms of like hearing that valerie coleman it's so that's so cool that uh valerie coleman for anyone who doesn't know was the founding flute flute player and was the flute player for a very long time uh, she's a uh, a renowned uh, performer and educator and leader in the arts and composer and um, and so you heard uh, you know this Valerie Coleman composition and then it turns out you didn't overlap with her though is that is that correct uh, in in the group no, did no, you? no. I, I didn't think so so no. um, yeah I didn't I didn't think that you did um, but uh, but yeah but tell us about about what it was like to join Amani Wins this group that you had looked up to. Um, well, funny thing, actually, when I moved to New York, uh, I was kind of, uh, wary, like I've been doing all of this preaching about how you reach out and you do this and you do that. I didn't feel like I was ready at the point that I was, I wanted when they heard me and they met me and that kind of thing for it to be in a situation where I felt like I was really, really presenting my best. Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually didn't develop a relationship with them in the two years that I was uh, at, at Manhattan School of Music, other than uh, with Mr. Scott, which was because my horn quartet worked with him uh, through uh, Sorry, hearing him call Mr. Yeah. Scott is funny. because like, uh, yeah, he <laughs> called, Before the call, I, I asked him something and he said, he called me sir. I'm like, oh man, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Scott. That's uh, pretty funny, man. Yeah, because Jeff Scott is a jackass just like us, who just happens <laughs> to be freakishly great at the horn and one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. But we'll let you call him Mr. Scott, whatever Mr. makes you Scott. comfortable. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he, yeah, he hates it when I call him. Mr. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, then yeah. I might call him Mr. Scott, but it, it, just... it won't have the same. It, when you call him Mr. Scott, it makes him feel old. When I do, he's just gonna be like, <laughs> "Shut up, hits." Yeah, like just mo- move along. Anyway, sorry. Continue. Um, yeah, no, we uh, we we worked with them um, for uh, through a grant program through Chamber of Music America called the Ensemble Four Grant. He was our, our coach. I uh, played in a, a horn quartet called Metropolitan Horn Authority, mm-hmm. um, and uh, that was my first time really like getting to meet him. Uh, so I had actually, you know, uh, so. I say that to say that uh, they're super intimidating. <laughs> the whole the whole proposition was very intimidating. And actually, um, I showed up right the last gig that I played uh, before the first shutdown. Well, the shutdown, I should say, um, was a gig where uh, he showed up and was playing fourth horn. I was playing second horn and he was playing fourth horn. Um and so that was our first time getting to like actually like hang out, you know, and be people, uh, and not just in a mentor to a group kind of coaching uh, relationship, um, you know. And that that was amazing because then it was like a little a little less scary. But I mean, even still, oh, so scared he blacked out. What the hell? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> One second, let me just. Okay, that should that should fix that. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, basically, I got an invitation to audition, which already for me was like, <gasps> like this is this is the greatest thing ever, um, and uh, which is completely and totally terrifying, uh, and so the first round of the audition was to uh record excerpts 
So total, there was about eight pieces, 14 excerpts. Uh, I had to record two solo excerpts as well. So I played a piece that I had written um, and then uh, Mozart horn concerto just for, uh, you know, get some variety in there so you can hear me playing different styles. Um, and I went to a studio and, uh, you know, well, I, I was a crazy person for a couple of months <laughs> and then finally got to a, a studio and laid down everything uh, over the course of four hours and um, then didn't hear anything for a few months. Radio silence. Oh, and I have to say the excerpts that they picked, it's like all, all the easy stuff, right? Like, <laughs> no, it was all of the hardest excerpts. I mean, it was the hardest stuff I ever played in my life, learning this music. Um, so I'm like getting ready to graduate from MSM and like kind of secretly preparing all of this music. Uh, so it was, a, it was a very like stressful time to, for sure, but exciting nonetheless. Um, but then uh, I did get invited to the, the second final round, um, which was a live recording session with them. Uh, so it was, you know, bring all the music uh, that the excerpts came from, but the full pieces um, and some sight reading. And we sat there for two hours and <laughs> recorded all of the pieces, basically. Um, and that was that was the audition was, you know, playing playing a two hour program and they kind of like watching my chops and <laughs> like, you know, is, is he going to make it, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, of course asking me to do backflips and handstands. Um, but you know, by, by that point, uh, it was actually really, really comfortable. Um, I saw I prepared so heavily. Uh, I have a very like regimented approach to preparing for auditions. Uh, so I felt super prepared. Um, for the audition walking in, I said to myself, uh, which is something that Effect actually taught me before I uh, went for grad school auditions, you know, she said, you know, say what, like, what is it that you want? And now say that you have it. And you approach, you approach auditions in that, in that regard, that it's like, you don't audition for something, you just do the job. You show up and you do the job, figure out what the job requires, and then, and then you just do that in the audition. Um, so, I walked in, you know, I said that to myself, I hyped myself up. I'm like, okay, I'm at the win this job. Like, I'm ready to go play this audition. Let's do it. Um, and then meeting them was a whole other level of comfort that, uh, uh, because they're also cool. Like, it was so chill. You know, I expected it to be, like, very, like, buttoned up. And uh, they made fun of me because I showed up in a suit uh the for actually the very first thing that was said to me when i showed up for that audition was monica goes do you have something to do after this <laughs> <laughs> I, I can completely hear her saying that that's awesome so uh you know that put me at ease and Aww. we're all sitting close to each other and uh you know, Monica, so we all, of course, you know, had to get tested before and that kind of thing. That's why, the, you know, recording studio closed space or whatever. Um, you know, Monica is sitting to the right of me in the audition, uh, as, as she does. And she has her bell pointed, like, almost directly at my face the entire time. So I'm just getting this, like, crazy bassoon sound. You know, she has, you know, nobody can do what she does. That's you know, a, amen to so that. There's this, this Some people try. Same sound. <laughs> and uh you know so anyway so as a horn player getting to sit in a woodwind quintet where previous to that it's like you know how do mm. i how do i how get soft small I you know play, I have, yeah. yeah how how's how in the background can i possibly be to suddenly sitting in this uh in this room and feeling like oh man like i can play like i can actually play my instrument uh right now is the most liberating experience i mean it was like like two of the most fun hours of my life i'm like in there making music with with my heroes and it's fun like it's fun so uh anyway so it was amazing and of wow. course then once i got the job like you know dream come true that was like <laughs> so great that was it that's oh, literally that's couldn't get any better 
That's just, awesome. We just had such, you know, we worked with them when we were Boston Brass. We did a couple of collaborations. And it was just the most fun. They were just so, it was everything you described. It was the, you know, it was the original crew. And yeah. um, just how awesome they were as a group musically and then individually as people. But the other lasting <laughs> memory I have is that they had more food on them at any given time than any group of five people I ever <laughs> saw in my life. They would just like pull out full casseroles out of their pocket. Like, what is happening? The first break, the first break in the first like, rehearsal that we had. Like a and turkey? There were- there were four four large Tupperwares that came out, and they were all like eating like healthy. It was like salads with proteins, and I was just like, and I remember I like looked over at Jeff, and he was just kind of nodded, like, "Yep." He's like, "Yeah, this is it." Like, I was like, "Wait, where did they flew in today? Where did the Tupperwares come yeah. from? Like, how do they have like prepared salads that are not store bought? What is what is happening here?" Yeah, that was professional yeah. professional road warriors. Yep. Yeah, it is. Uh, it has not changed. We can we can eat. <laughs> that is pretty good yeah that is we pretty can good. eat for sure so when we when we played um the the you know the programs that we did with amani we we set up in a v where boston brass yeah. was here you know amani was here so monica was on my right and her and we she and i were playing a whole lot of unison stuff and so like, yeah, I was like her, you know, her bassoon pointing right at my head. It was like, I described it as I told her, like in one of the rehearsals, I was like, you're playing right at my head. It's like the answer key is just being like, you know, like matrixed <laughs> yeah. into my head. And all I had to do was just layer on top of that. And then I sounded real good. Like, you know, it's like, it was just, yeah, it was just there. It was just like the model. And the thing I love about Amani Wins is that Amani Wins is a woodwind quintet who at times can play like a brass quintet and at times can play like a string quartet. And it's like, you know, can just play huge and in your face, but also delicate. It's just like, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different, uh, you know, colors that come out of the sound of that group. Um, And um, they rise above the medium, you know, it's like you're, you have an expectation of what a brass quintet is supposed to do. And then empire comes along and then there's like, Oh, Oh, okay. It's like that. And then you have this expect, oh, we're we're gonna go hear a wind quintet. Oh, great. Four hours of Rika. Won't that be fun? And then all of a sudden <laughs> Amani takes the stage. He's like, oh, 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 oh. Oh, I see. This is something completely different than I thought it was. And it's just it rises above the label like Kronos did with string quartets or Room yeah. Full of Teeth does with a, a, a with a, a vocal group. It's just it rises above the label that we think we know uh, it's a, supposed to be. B. Oh, two. And I actually, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, there. it's all just random, unnecessary <laughs> air quotes. Dinner. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, it's okay. I don't so... mind. <laughs> <laughs> One of the uh, actually the first the first like major gig that I got in being in New York was in my second semester at MSM, and I, you know, I was not I didn't know where it came from I just got this email one day from a contractor asking if I wanted to play with room full of teeth at the Kennedy Center and yeah, I was like answer that email fast are you are you kidding me that's awesome <laughs> um so yeah speaking of so it's just like that's that's kind of been my life is that I've been surrounded by these musicians that are just like doing what they want to do boy how close were you to I mean it's it scares me to think how close it, it if it weren't for some happy accidents that, and you thought that the only path was an orchestral career that, that I wouldn't get a chance to meet you this way. It just frightens me that we might've lost you. Oh. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's very kind. Yeah. Um, well, and I'm, let me, and a lesson for all the young musicians out there is that, uh, that, that you can hear just from this conversation, how thoughtful and pleasant, Kevin is right. You're a human. I'm sure that there are times when you're not exactly the best version of yourself, right? Like I've, uh, For sure, I've, yeah. I've certainly never seen it, but like, but yeah, it's like, I've also never been on the road with you. You know, it's like, I've never been your roommate, you know, it's like, it happens, but like people who have a great attitude about things and are curious and in our business tend to get lucky a lot. <laughs> like they just, they do like, because if I can, if I can recommend Kevin for a gig or I can recommend somebody else who, and it's a short list of people, 
but who can play the horn like Kevin does and like who's not quite as nice like I'm not positive that they're going to fit then like I'm going to recommend Kevin a hundred out of a hundred times over the other person even if they could both play the music you know in their own ways the same you know to the same level and so just be kind like just be be kind and be thoughtful and have empathy for people and just like you know be appreciative and and your phone's gonna ring or email or text or yeah we're you know there's a lot of ways to get hired for stuff now so totally um, did you ever find out how you got that gig for the kennedy center did you ever trace it or uh I, I did actually. I started after that point. I started getting all these random emails uh, for gigs, and I won't I won't say what person it sure. was because they would prefer that I did not. Right on. Um, but but there was a person that uh, you know I was uh, playing a concert at MSM, and they were in the audience, uh, and that was that. There um, it is. You know, and they, they never said anything to me. I had to figure it out myself. I had to figure out where the connections were and kind of email them and be like, hey, look, are you the one that's like <laughs> kind of like pull, pulling the strings of this thing right now? Um, and I'm just so, so thankful for that. And, uh, you know, I and I, I should stop there for a second, just very quickly and say that I attribute that to, A, I mean, that's how my family is and how they taught me to be. They don't meet strangers um and they believe in the the good the good in people uh even when um even when they should um and i i think uh that in conjunction with growing up in a place uh you know where just so much kindness i mean even like you know where i grew up like even the people that didn't like you were nice to you you know if you know, somebody saw you stranded on the side of the road, they could hate your guts, but they're probably going to stop and help you. Um, and that's just kind of the culture um, of, of the place. And so that has been, you know, that and just respect, you know, respecting people. Those are the things that are like, like built into me because of those experiences. So I cannot be, I can't be more thankful um, for those formative uh, experiences. And yeah, like be nice, like, be kind and i think it's it's definitely worked to my advantage that like you said you know i don't have any choice but to be i mean i got i think i'm a nice person <laughs> you know i don't really have much that's, of a choice that's not what mr scott <laughs> thinks but that's a topic for a different thing. well it's you know, it, that, well, you know that's the, and what you that's important like, to 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 put a button on that you you don't know the impact that you're having in a positive way that can cause the email to show up to get invite to invite you to a gig. And you also don't know the impact that you made when somebody overheard you maybe not being uh, uh, a nice person or not doing what you could. And then it just, you didn't get an email and you didn't even know that you might have gotten an email. Like, it's just like yeah. silent. That's it. That's it. And I'm, I, you didn't say, maybe it was, but you didn't say that the concert that this person who ended up becoming such an asset for you that you played was like one of the biggest concerts you played in grad school. It was just one of the concerts for the two years. And you took it just as seriously. Really important people in the music business tend to not introduce themselves ahead of time or afterwards as, hi, my name's Kevin and I'm really important. Mm -hmm. So you need to play really well and you need to show people <laughs> respect or, you know, it's kind of like restaurant, uh, you know, like uh, reviewers where they like, they, they go in incognito, like, cause they don't want, if you know that the New York times restaurant critic is like, is in the restaurant, then of course every dish is going to be timed perfectly. And the actual right. head chef of there, there is going to even plate everything. I mean, you know, that's not a typical experience. And it's the same with important people in the music business. They tend to just sit back there, clap when everyone else claps and go home, but they're always taking, always taking notes always taking notes and uh yeah and you you pass that test with flying colors and then oh by the way when you show up at the kennedy center for room full of teeth you obviously did a great job and you got along with everybody because if not it would have gotten back to the person who recommended you and then they mm -hmm. probably still wouldn't have reached out to you but they wouldn't recommend you for anything else because that would have made them look bad like yeah he sounded great but he was a total pain in the ass that's the end of that line right and they're they won't even necessarily be super mad but they're just like they're never recommending you for anything ever again. So yeah. Yep. Just be good. Just be good. And it's like, it's easy most yep. of the time, except for when it's not, but that's when your reputation <laughs> is based on, right. Is when, yep. 
a gig is supposed to be super cool and then it's not and you just you know it's how you deal with it so um we are just about out of time but i want to give you like just a minute to tell us about um about your horn quartet um and then we're gonna have you stick around for the bonus episode so um first of all lance can you spell metropolitan for us uh, here on the (laughs) R. No, wait. <laughs> so tell us about the Metropolitan Horn Authority, Kevin. Uh, so it's it's a group of um, musicians. Three of us are from Virginia. Actually, the guy that started it, Peter Del Grosso, we were in undergrad together. Cool. Uh, my friend Blair Hamrick, we're uh, actually in the same doctoral program currently. Uh, and my friend Sarah Convalin, who is from Texas, uh, all monster players. And um, we're doing a lot to try and uh have as much fun as we possibly can uh, with the horn and bring the horn to 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 the world in a different way than it has been represented before so uh all great things but um yeah visit us metropolitanhornauthority.com check us out we're doing a virginia tour in the spring uh so yeah what where are you, you going to be up in northern virginia at all so uh no i think actually the well, that was the incorrect answer, Kevin, because I want to come. Actually, actually, maybe. We'll we'll talk. To, we'll talk. Yeah, I'd, love I, to, I'd love to sorry. catch you. So that's all right. Uh, all right. So this boy, what a pleasure. This, uh, I mean, I, this is what I was expecting, but um, but your um, your perspective was uh, is just so refreshing. I mean, just about like how you're approaching things. And the early and I, what I said at the beginning, I meant that you're you look at your resume and you could do nothing new and then just keep doing this for a couple more decades and then retire. And it's going to people are going to go like, wow, what an impressive career. But you're just getting started. Like, I, you don't even know, like, what directions you're going to be going. And you got so much runway in front of you, which is like which is exciting. I think you're going to move an awful lot of things uh, forward for an awful lot of uh, people. And uh, I'm excited to see where it all goes. So there, Kevin. So there. Thank you. Uh, And uh, thank you for having me also. Oh, yeah, of course. Of course. So we are going to have Kevin stick around for the bonus episode, which uh, every guest uh, has a bonus episode, which releases one week after the regular interview, which is available to all of our Patreon patrons. Thank you to all of you who have already gone to patreon.com slash the brass junkies. You help uh, keep the lights on. Uh, around here uh lance has uh caviar tastes on a euphonium budget so it definitely uh you know helps that as well and uh, but no we got a lot of expenses and uh, and it helps with all of them and uh so thank you to uh to everyone who has uh, supported the show and if you want to support us in a different way just like share this episode with somebody who you think would uh would really benefit from it and um yeah you covered so much human stuff as well as horn stuff i think this one's going to really resonate so kevin thank you so much and um thanks for joining us lance you were i thought you were super focused on this one i really thought i'm sorry wait 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 what you brought you really you really seem to bring a little a little extra a little extra something even if spelling is not your forte so for the the background here is that he tried to type metropolitan horn authority and his first attempt at metropolitan was so bad that Google didn't even suggest a, a fix. Like that's how that's how bad it was. So there was a seven right. in it. There was a <laughs> yeah, like you had like Russian alphabet characters yeah. in it. All right, so uh, that is going to do it for another episode of the Brass Junkies. You've been listening to The Brass Junkies on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to hear the bonus episode featuring today's guest, please visit patreon.com slash thebrassjunkies to learn how you can support the show and instantly access all bonus materials as well as gain access to a special patron-only Facebook group. The Brass Junkies is produced by the amazing, wonderful, and truly inspirational Will Houchen. The theme music was composed by Fernando Dados and performed by Andrew Hitz and Lance Lidu. Duke. We are at Pray for Yens on Twitter and Instagram and have a Facebook page at facebook.com slash pray for Yens. You can find out more about the Brass Junkies and all the other Pedal Note Media podcasts at pedalnotemedia.com. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network.